Mamas Mamas is well known, always present on the Twitter. If, if you by chance happen to open your Twitter right now, you'll already find at least 15 posts from him right since the beginning, inception. <laughs> so it's like a live coverage and I, I really enjoyed his coverage of his dinner yesterday. He, he went to Indian accent and those lovely dishes and we just felt jealous of Mama's yesterday. <laughs> so Mama's is one of our stars from UK who's heavily into 49. So yeah, sorry, I, I, somebody I told him he's got 40,000, so my apologies. 50,000 is just the landmark to be touched. By the end of this meeting, he'll be 50,000. <laughs> so, <clears throat> can I also invite Dr. Pankaj Jariwala? Pankaj Jariwala is a friend from Hyderabad and maybe he's just finishing his last bite, so I'll wait for him. Dr. P.K. Hazra is here with us. He's the star from Calcutta. He's so very strong in his social media posting of educational material on all the groups that we have in our country. And he's one of the leading lights who has taken Calcutta interventions to a bigger height. Calcutta has picked up a little later, but now it's amongst the top few leading centers uh, in our country. So, and I still remember my first LA appendage case, which I did. Dr. Hazra had proctored me in that case and he refused to scrub and he was just I was worried, you know, why isn't he scrubbing up? But that's how he is. So, thank you very much. Dr. Nagendra Bhupati. Dr. Nagendra Bhupati is uh, from my old alma mater, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He's trained in New York at the Mount Sinai in structural heart disease and coronary interventions. So, and now he's uh, practicing in Chennai and amongst the so many galaxy of stars which are there in Chennai, he's amongst those stars already and you know? he's just recently come back. So welcome Dr. Nagendra Bhupati. <coughs> Dr. Sanjay G Tyagi is my very close friend, professor and head of GV Panth Hospital and we have traveled so many paths together. So pleasure to have you Dr. Sanjay, please join us over here. Dr. YKD Bhattarai has come all the way from Kathmandu, Nepal. He is the largest volume operator in that part of the world with all complex procedures including rotas, left mains, calcified lesions, structural heart interventions. Dr. Manbir Khurana, our ex-fellow, is a little fond of eating. So we're just going to wait, just we'll wait, wait it out for him. He'll join us. Apur Mittal is here. Uh, he's trained with us at Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and is now practicing in uh, a, a near town of Muradabad. And Apoor has earned a very good reputation for himself. Dr. L.C. Daga, Lalchan Daga, we missed him in the last session. So when Dr. Daga, come. Jariwala, please. And Dr. Bipin K. Dubey you know, will also step into. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. So this session is going to be very exciting because there are a lot of people who, as soon as they look at dense calcium in the coronary angiogram, they start calling their surgeons, which is now changing. You know? And with leading lights like Kirti Punamia, who's been tackling calcium for ages, it is very important to peep into his mind. You know, how, when he sees calcium, how does he start thinking about it? So over to you, Kirti. Uh, the stage is yours. <coughs> You, you got a short break after your last session. So we'll get started with Kirti Punamir. Uh, yes, the rock man. Huh? <laughs> I mean, you don't know whether you're at the rock end or the deep end of the thing at any time. You're always in between. You always pull them out of the deep end. <laughs> so um, again, thank you, Atul. And this is, again, one of our favorite topics, calcium, because it's... It's been a thorn in our flesh uh, ever since we've come into the cat lab. How do I assess it? The first thing I do is I assess it and see if it's crossable. There are two things about crossability that I look at. Is it crossable with an IBIS catheter? And is it crossable with a micro catheter? In that order. Don't ever try to cross calcified lesions with a balloon. The problem is when you put in a balloon, it'll go and then you'll be tempted to dilate and then you missed your opportunity to do things which might be correct. So 
Ivis catheter or OCT catheter, OCC, uh, OCT catheter is a little more flimsy, so Ivis is sturdier. Put in an Ivis catheter, it doesn't go. Put in a micro catheter, if it goes, you got your story, now you have two choices. A rotational atherectomy, or you could change it to, if you have orbital atherectomy, or when we do, we will have the orbital atherectomy, so you put in a viper wire or a rotor wire, and you have two options. Say the micro catheter doesn't go. Then you have, then you have a tornus, which you could use, or you use an ELCA. And I'll show you how we use ELCA in our practice. And then imaging catheter goes. And if it does go, then you image. And you look at those images, and it still doesn't rule out any of these devices that we used in the past, like oh, above. So let's go through this. The most frequently, the most frequently rotational atherectomy is a tool of uncrossable lesions. So uncrossable because of microcatheter or imaging, whatever, delivering the rotational atherectomy wire is the key. So here, what we do is most of the times we use a fine cross microcatheter. Take a normal standard wire, put in a fine cross microcatheter, and you change it for a rotor wire, and you're done. Often, some people have nudged a Corsair into the lesion and then put in a rotor wire because they made some path with their normal wires, and then you can nudge it. Make sure that you don't angle your rotor wire too much. Keep it partially angled. Don't give a complete 45. Keep a very narrow angle. Then. We've then, in these awkward cases with right angle bends, we've taken over the wire balloons, but we don't use over the wire balloons anymore because we have better tools and now we've kind of grown away. But this is historical perspective over the wire balloons has been used. You take a one o balloon, anchor it into the lesion, and then you put your rotor wire in. This is, uh, this is a very awkward situation where we had, where the guiding catheter was not, we used a guide extension. Through that, we had a tornus, a 2.1, the fine cross catheter would not go, so we used a tornus. And the tornus was used to place a rotor wire and then complete the case. Remember, when you're using microcatheters, which are the fine cross microcatheter, it is the most commonly used catheter. Remember, when you actually put it in a micro, in, into a calcified lesion, very important, when you take it out, take a picture of it, the tip of the picture. Sometimes you'll see it's as frayed as this. Don't reuse it, because if you put that microcatheter in again, you will dissect the artery, you will cause perforations. This is one of the reasons why you see in the end of a case that you distally cause damage is because you actually went and put in a damaged microcatheter downstream and you don't even realize it. So the most frequently used rotational atherectomy, again, undeliverable. This is a CTO case that we did um, in a live case um, last week uh, into TCT. You can see this right coronary artery. Um, uh, I could see a small little channel through it, so crossing was not a problem with the wire. But I just could not, um, once the wire was crossed, uh, I was struggling. I, I had a back out of my guiding catheter, uh, and it wouldn't let my microcatheter go in. So when I, microcatheter would not go, uh, we used a, so we used an ELCA, which is um, a 0.9 fiber, uh, AT80 fluencies. We don't even try with lower frequencies. Uncrossable lesions go straight to AT80. Use, make sure that the most important lesson over here is when you're using it in de novo arteries, make sure you flushed out your contrast, which is in the guide catheter. Make sure that you're given a couple of saline flushes. Make sure there's no contrast in the system because otherwise you cause barotrauma, which can be quite unforgiving. But otherwise, once you've done that, uh, the you will see that the, uh, the AT80 catheter goes very well, uh, goes past the lesion, and then that sets you up for putting in a microcatheter, changing it for a, a rotor wire, and in which case we did a rotational atherectomy and concluded the case, which was great. Uh, so accessibility uh, for access, it's a great tool. So tortoise. This is a, a similar case we did many years ago, and where uh, our go-to device all the time was uh, Tornus. So anytime I went into the cath lab, I had a bag full of Tornus with me, 2.1, 2.6. And the Tornus typically uh, was this metal head. Uh, only thing you've got to make sure that you don't unravel it when you're doing it. And unraveling a Tornus could mean sometimes a surgical emergency. So you've got to be a little careful with using this device. And if you're using it for the first time, it's okay to have a guy who's actually used it a few times before you do it. And here is a case where the corner, the Corsair did not budge in. We couldn't put in a micro catheter. The fine cross wouldn't go in, so we used a Tornus 2.6 French. And in a straight course, I prefer 2.6 because it's easy to exchange a rotor wire with it. In an or angulated artery, I'll take a 2.1. Uh, then post rotor, you can create a channel enough. So it is a device. It's a lesion modifying tool in itself, which allows me to put in an NC balloon, dilate, and complete the case. So that's great. And so this was one. Here, we had a little different challenge. We could not get the microcatheter in after the Gaia had crossed. So we did, it was a difficult uh, cross. And so you take a seven French guide catheter, in that is a guidezilla, in that is a tornus, in that is a Gaia wire. And now you put in your Gaia wire, you get your tornus down, 
Then you exit with your wire, and then you put your rotor wire inside, and then do a rotational arthroectomy, and you completed the case. So the tornus used as a launch to keep your rotor wire in. Now, what happens when you have an ACS with calcium? You have an ACS, this is an elderly man, elderly man, they have very large plaque volumes, they are calcified plaque volumes, and the thrombus element is less. But even though the thrombus element is less, you see a very uncrossable lesion, you want to whip out your rotor blader. The problem with these cases is that you do a rotor blader in these cases, you see immense slow flow, and you start seeing slow flow. Very important, we, in the previous session, one of the presenters presented a case where they found an attenuated plaque, we did a dilatation. When you start seeing thrombus-laden plaques, you got to think, if there's a stable patient, go back, put these people on blood thinners for a while, get them back into the cath lab before you, because slow flow can be nasty and it can actually cause death. So don't get into that space. So here we were scared, but modified. You can see my IVIS catheter is struggling. I had to have an ablative tool, so again, Elka comes in handy. Elka with saline did not cross, so here very judicial, very, very cautiously, we used a contrast, and the contrast helped us cross that little lesion. We were able to do that, simple. Once that had happened, uh, rest was simple. Uh, we just went in and did a cutting balloon. This is a, a longish uh, ibis guidance. And with the ibis, you can see that even though you have a longish kind of fear, you have disease in the distal part is not too bad. Then there is a little segment which has opposing calcium plates and primarily in the proximal part, there is an eccentric calcified area, non-protruding. So you know that your next challenge is going to be the central part over here. So what is the central part? You need to know your sizes first. Once you have a size first, you decide whether you want to take an NC balloon or you want to decide with a Wolverine balloon. You can, the, the, it's in your choice. You could use either or. Whichever is there, both will work equally well in this kind of scenario. I chose a Wolverine. So this is the images that I got. What do these images tell me? Yeah, going from the left, this is a non-protruding calcified plaque at the left, which is less than 180 degrees. Anything works over here, and nothing really matters with this kind of a calcium. You are not going to, this calcium is not going to cause you trouble. Ignore it. The second slide on that is a non-protruding opposing plate. So there are two opposing plates of calcium with fibrotic tissue in between. Now, that is important because... If this is an unexpanded area with an NC balloon, then the next thing is that OP and, uh, the, the, um, the IVL balloon will work in this because there's calcium at one end, calcium on the other end, and so there's effective deliverance of the energy that is very important. The rest is the second is a fibrocalcific with 300 with cracks already. So why fibrocalcific? Because it's not entirely calcific. It was entirely calcific. My vision beyond the lesion, my vision beyond the initial segment of brightness would be zero. I'm seeing beyond it. So therefore, it's fibrocalcific. And these do well with a cutting balloon as well. Whereas when you look at that attenuated thrombus, that was the problem. If you do rotablator when you have these kind of attenuated, what is an attenuated plaque? A simple thing. When you cannot see the intimal reflection, that means you don't see a guide sharp intima, then you know that there's something which is causing you, and then you will see that you, you have an echo void over here. And that echo void cannot be explained with calcium sheet. So when you see a void of echo, and your echo is attenuated, but there is no brightness of calcium to explain it, think of thrombus. In those cases, rotational arthroctomy is going to hurt you, so don't pull out your rotoblader in these plaques. So again, for me, cutting balloon is great for these. Uh, fibrocalcific again. So what did I do? Elka followed by cutting. Cutting was 3 of size based on the ibis. And then I'll go with the 3.5 proximally, because proximally it was eccentric plaque, so I'm not going to worry about it. Alternatively is rota, but the problem is downside of rota is slow flow. So I did that. This is a cutting balloon. This is the NC balloon proximally. End of story. This is a large star. Now what is important when you do these? Very important. Look at this septal. When you start seeing large septal arteries compromising flow in calcified arteries, the time to save your septal. Remember, you lose a large proximal septal, you'll have some chest pain. But what I fear is some of these people develop complete heart block at 48 and 72 hours and 96 hours. So if you do lose it and you don't potentially save it, keep this patient in your ICU care and just make sure that you're watching his rhythm closely. They do develop complete heart block. So remember, that is a big problem. I've changed my practice, and this is a practice-changing slide for me. I make sure that I go ahead and put in a septal balloon, keep the flow in that septal preserved, and then it's okay and you're going to be fine. So don't want to lose, you don't want to have zero flow in a large proximal septum. 
Now, of course, you optimize it. And sometimes in these eccentric plaques, you will see that elliptical areas are fine. As long as the MSs are good, don't chase them. Yeah. 70 year old stable limiting angina, very, very easy. It looks like, okay, should I even do this lesion? Then you do an FFR and it's 0.74. So you have to do this lesion and the IBIS catheter doesn't go again. Your tool to go to is rotational atherectomy. So we do the rotational atherectomy, do an IBIS. And then, of course, it's a standard thing. Your NC balloon doesn't expand completely over there. So you use an IVL, you see that indent, it goes away. And then you complete it and then you chase it with the IBIS to make sure, like I said in the morning, the expected MS is you need to have a chart. Okay, I need to have an MS you have this in this segment, this in this, how far have I gone to achieve it? And then don't go crazy. There are going to be times when you can't achieve it. So you have to decide the judicious boundary of safety against madness. And you don't want to go crazy in the cat lab and you want to be safe in the cat lab. Perforations, not acceptable at any point in time. Restenosis is acceptable. Perforations, not acceptable. Remember that. So here's a story for me. And this is a very important, look at this CT. There's a CT, and we look at CTs almost in all calcium cases, but this I thought was important because here I thought, when I looked at this artery and said, oh, this is like a slam dunk. Should, maybe a fellow can do it. Straightforward, type A lesion in that sense. Very simple. So I said, you know, with that kind of calcium, I shouldn't have a problem. Let me put in my balloon. So I put in my 2.5 balloon. Exactly the thing which somebody asked me this question out in the corridor. Should I do this? No, I shouldn't do this, but I did it. Why? Because it seemed like a simple thing to do. Most of us want to do the simple thing in life. So we do this. Now, what happens then? It goes in, we do an OCT. And this OCT, what does it show me? Look at this. These images are important. This image right in the center, it tells me that there's a normal artery here, and there's a chunk of protruding calcium. Can you see this protruding calcium, which is eccentric? This is a chunk of calcium. The minute I saw this, I knew that I had a problem. And when, but it was too late because I'd done a 2.5, I dissected the artery. Now if I use a 1.5 burr, it may have floated through. I could have used a 2 burr and yes, it may have done something. But I said, okay, let me put in my stent and do it. So we chased it with a 3 we, we chased it with the higher pressure balloons, we dilated it, we put in our stent. We went in and did a 3.5 millimeters balloon dilatation. You can see that the 3.5 NC balloon seems like it has expanded, right? In two views, orthogonal views, you look at it and it looks good. This is the MSA. MSA is 4.5. And this is a 3.5. 9.5 is the baseline MSA expected, 4.5. I'm nowhere close to what I think I should have achieved. So I said, desperate times, desperate measures. We said, let me see if the IVL works. So we put in an IVL balloon, expanded 80 pulses in that area. What did IVL do? Angiographically, nothing. But it did a little bit, 4.55 to 4.75. What did it do? It did nothing. It actually spent 3 lakhs of rupees down the drain. My question is, time to retrospect. Was it worth it? Was it worth doing this madness? No. Do all unexpanded stents come back? They don't. This area was 4.5 and above. It's okay, leave it. If he comes back with a TLR, that time, rotablator would be the thing. And I told you in the morning sometimes that we have this protruding calcium. Because if I do a rotablator now, then I have to put in a second layer of stent inside over here, which I don't want to do. And not all of these patients are going to come back with a TLR. So there is a clear-cut definition of an unexpanded stent, which is unexpanded, which is image-defined, and an unexpanded stent, which is failed. Failed means it has come with a TLR, it has come with stent thrombosis, or it is causing ischemia because of a positive inducible ischemia. That's what. So you have to define whether you're falling in the category of a, just a pure imaging-defined unexpanded stent, because in those cases, don't go crazy. That's the story. I had two opportunities in this case to make a correction. One was I had difficulty in crossing the balloon. I should have re recognized that. And if I'd seen eccentric calcium as my novo de novo, I would have done a rotablator and I would have been in a better place right now, but I didn't. Even after I saw the OCT, I saw that chunk of calcium and I still could have done it, but I didn't. Two mistakes cost me a compromised MSA. This is another case. 80 year, old, 80, 80 year old lady came in with an inferior wall MI. We did that in RCA, opened the RCA, opened the circumflex, and this was the LED, which was all thrombotic again. I didn't want to leave it for another day, so we had the ELCA out. Um, we took our ELCA catheter, went past it, and because we did the ELCA, this is the IVUS, and you can see the IVUS case over there. Now, if I look at it and I analyze all these images, 
all these images don't do anything major to me. The image which disturbs me the most is this eccentric plaque, which is protruding to some extent. And so when we look at it, we go ahead with the Wolverine, and the Wolverine does not expand at 18 atmospheres. Don't go beyond it. So we used an IVL. The IVL, we expend 80 energies. Now we did the IVL first. We were smart this time. We didn't want to put a stent, right? So we put in an IVL 80, 80 pulses, and the IVL does not expand. And so I said, okay, damn it, let's put the stent in. And you can see that indentation on the stent is clear. What is the IVS? There's eccentric, it is a difficult subset. The area was 5.4 millimeter square in what was a 3.25, 8.5 millimeter artery. I didn't want to show you the IVS images, but what it shows me is this. Balloon dilatation strategy up front in a calcified lesion confirms a com com confirm that you have a complete expansion, one is to one, before you put your stent in. Expansion of a smaller balloon does not and should not be considered as a lesion preparation. One, balloon dilatation strategy up front in calcified lesion. If a post small balloon dilatation imaging shows a large protruding calcium, if there's a wire which is favorable to it, use a rotablator or use an orbital arthrectomy when we get it. And in 2020, we used 50 IVL cases or with various strategies. Six out of those 50 had protruding calcium of less than 180 degrees. One in six used. One of those six cases was post-DS implantation, as I showed you. Out of the three, out of the six cases, failed to expand with complete deliverance of 80 pulses in that. So for me, in eccentric protruding calcium, IVL is only 50% success, and that's an important thing. We talk about fluoroscopy calcium. I didn't see any fluoroscopy calcium on this case. But why did my balloon not dilate at 2.5 and a 3.5 balloon at 24 atmospheres? It didn't want to dilate. And look at that ring. Time to pull out your rotablator. Makes your life very simple and you complete the case. So undilatable lesion is another thing. Now your imaging catheter goes in. If your imaging catheter does go in, which is the right hand side of the slide that I started with, then when your imaging catheter goes in, you realize this kind of calcium. Look at this, you defined your calcium and you can see that there's all calcium which is more than 180 degrees. There's opposing plates of calcium in various places. Now, how do you plan this case? You almost always start with a 1.1, 1, .1, 1 is to 1 NC balloon. And you can see that there is a serious indentation. But now we are more poised. This is likely to break with, cal with IVL. So you take a 4 IVL, hit it a 3.5 IVL with 40 pulses, it opens up well, and then of course, you have cracked it. You can notice those cracks. Sometimes you do multiple and you'll see multiple cracks. But don't think that you're going to see cracks every time. You may not see the cracks. You would need to make sure that the expansion is more important than the cracks, in my opinion. And then you will do, you will do uh, uh, an OCT, and it is a well-expanded stent all across, and that's fine. In this heavily calcified lesion, very, very heavily calcified, the rotablator 1.5 burr took three and a half minutes to go, rotablator ablation time. So it took a long time to go past this. So we did an IVUS after that. And when we do an IVUS after the first rotational arthrectomy, this is the IVUS data that you see. Look at this IVUS. Protruding calcium, protruding calcium, protruding calcium everywhere, which is one side eccentric, but the wire is right in the middle of the calcium. This was before the IVL days. Today, somebody may say, I would pull out the IVL catheter, I mean IVL balloon and do it. For me, this is step the burr up, go to 175. Do a 1.75 or a 2 over because that is shave a little more and make your life easy, which is exactly what we did. So we went to the 1.75 burr, and once we did that, this was a post rota result. And what happens? Change your burr after 300 or 400 seconds of burr time. Why? Not because the diamonds go away, not because there's sludge of anything of that sort, but see what happens. Look at the tip. This is the tip. This is your new burr, and this is a soft metal. But when you rotate this metal at a very high speed in these very unfavorable anatomies at high speed, it's like doing pottery. The metal becomes melted off and it kind of spins out and it flanges out. And because it flanges out, it makes that burr ineffective. In fact, that is one of the reasons why the burr will cut a wire as well. This is an image which is sent to me by Virash, who is my close colleague from Bangkok. Since then, we've take, taken photographs of many burrs. We keep all burrs which go more than 300 milliseconds. And we are putting in a study and a paper together. And we probably publish this along together uh, with him uh, maybe next year. 
uh, it requires special lenses to do these photographs. So anyway, we completed this case. We realized that the diagonal branch, very important, was in that, in, in that the IVAS also showed us very simply, and that is something that I forgot to mention to you, that can you look at this IVAS image? The angiography did not, but the IVAS image showed that the diagonal branch was severely narrowed with a calcified area, and it went up to 12 millimeters, or, uh, 12 atmospheres of pressure to open that artery up. It was, open, it was important to open that artery before you stented it, but it was just a balloon dilatation. Three years later, this man had an RCA lesion, so we had the a, a, you know, ability to study his LED, which was fine. Again, I'm going to skip this because this is, again, a laser in a CTO which required this. And again, the same concept that I talked about in the morning about uh, as an alternative tool, you do an IVIS and then the IVIS decides the strategy. The strategy has to be pre-decided. Uh, the, pre the concept has to be, it has to be from a drawing board to the cat lab. So we are like engineers. We need to have a sketch. We need to have a mindset. We need to have the mindset and we need our destinations. And when we have a destination in mind, then you're going to have the right results. And that is the important message that I want to go from here. So this is exactly the same IBL and the story. So when you have imaging catheters and you have the imaging, look at the arc of calcium, look at the length of calcium, look at the thickness, look at the protrudeness, look at the look at the wire bias, look at the reverberations. Reverberations mean thinner calcium. You've already done a lot of... Now, if none of this are there, you can go to one is to one NC balloon or a coring balloon, toss a coin and decide what you want to do. But if you don't have it, if you have these three, then you go to burr escalation. And depending if you have, if you still have an expansion, then you can go for the IVL shockwave. I'm going to stop here and take questions if there is any. Excellent. This, this guy. Um, yeah, thank you. It was an outsta outstanding talk, and I think it serves to illustrate uh, some important points. As the tool was referring to, when we did our training back in the early 1990s, uh, there was only one tool to treat calcium, and that was rotational atherectomy. So it's, calcium was the nail, and rotational atherectomy was the hammer. Wherever we saw calcium, we put out the rotaber. Uh, but now we have other tools at our disposal. We have rotational atherectomy, we have uh, orbital, we have shockwave, so we have more tools. And with intracoronary imaging, you can really tailor uh, the treatment to the, to the type of pathology or the type of calcium you have. As, a, as, a, as the examples he showed here today, nodular calcium usually is far more suitable for treatment with atherectomy, such as rotational or orbital, that is with shockwave. So you can learn a lot by imaging and knowing which tool to use. You want to project this one last slide, which is there and, on my laptop? Uh, and and, and this is, uh, I think, very important. In the old days, yes, we only had one tool. So if we saw calcium, we didn't have much choice. Just take out the rotational atherectomy uh, and do what you can. But now that we have these tools, I think it's incumbent upon us to uh, look, image, understand what we're dealing with, and then select the appropriate modality for calcium modification. And I think the case I'm going to present is going to was one of the was the the case that actually uh, made me see the light and changed my view. Because up until that case, it was rotational atherectomy. Yeah. You know this. Uh, so, just as an, your opinion regarding this. So, um, now that we have imaging. So um, we do an imaging. If there is an uh, intraluminal calcium, we use a rotor ablation. If there is an um, extraluminal calcium, we do an IVL. Would that help solve? That's the not problem? true. That's not true. So let 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 me correct you, uh, correct a little small statement there. There's no extra luminal calcium. So what you're talking about is EL, and everything happens within the EL. What happens outside the EL doesn't matter. So it's an intraplaque calcium which you don't see, or you see. All you need to see is calcium towards the lumen. So any calcium that touches the lumen is going to interfere with the procedure. Any calcium that doesn't touch the lumen but is hiding behind is going to interfere with expansion. Both the calciums are going to hurt you. Some I think will he's not. Talking as long about medial as medial calcification. He's talking but about I meant medial, medial calcification. Medial calcification. If there's a medial calcification, then we use the IVL. And if there's a luminal calcification, which is inside, the lumen, we do a rotor ablation now that the imaging is there. Could that make it so, simpler for us? In my experience, media doesn't get calcified. It's a muscle layer and it remains muscle. You either have calcification within the media, 
And that is because your media goes out because you have positive vascular remodeling and there's a difference between your media. So please, the concept is very important. Why is it important? Because sometimes when you have these vascular modeling, remodeling, and you do a rotablator and you see a new lumen, and you feel, oh, you've gone outside the vessel wall. You're not, you're still in the vessel wall. It's just that you're so deep in the plaque that it appears that there are two lumens, which are not. So refer to is that inter, it's all intra-plaque. Deeper layers of calcium. You may not see the deeper layers of calcium sometimes because if there's a superficial calcium, you may not see it. So recognizing calcium is one thing, but the algorithm that you're going to use in how you pull out these devices have to be in a particular order. This light says it. So my first device, these are my access tools. That means this tells me that these tools are going to allow me to get into the artery. Then I image. And then I realized that no, I need to do more work and then I have to more work with the same tools. So I have to change the tools one over the other and then I image again. Until I get to an NC balloon and then I get to some of my really high pressure or my shock waves. I now think, Priti, you are iverscentric and rotocentric mind. If you do not have rotocentric or iverscentric mind, if you do the OCT, we do see medial calcification. Mamas? Yeah, so uh, one of the points about your case with the nodular calcium, I mean, so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've, I, I use a lot of lithotripsy and OCT every case, and it's not very useful in those sorts of cases. I posted a case similar to yours on Twitter where I stented after, wrote, after doing a CTO case, nodule, not big nodule of calcium, stented it, couldn't expand it, tried lithotripsy, didn't work. Um, I found that using 50-50 contrast and laser in these cases, um, once you've stented, is reasonably safe. I, I've not had perforations and you fraction, you get much better MLA. So though laser does work and we've used it now, we've got a fair experience and we're establishing, like, we've gone on to 42 cases of laser in the last one year and uh, a large 25 of them, 25 of them are calcified lesions with thrombus and various settings. There is a point beyond which the laser catheter won't go in a calcified lesion. And the problem is that if there is a bend or if there's an eccentric plaque with a normal segment of wall on the outer side of your laser catheter, stop lasing because you're very likely to damage the normal wall, which is very prone to damage. So if you have plaque all around, the laser is fine and you use a guide cat extension, center the laser catheter, you're fine. <clears throat> But laser can be dangerous when you start using with contrast, as I showed you, it has to be with a guide catheter, with a guide extension catheter. So we are building our laser experience. You guys are much more experienced. No, but I'm laser. talking about the, the lesion that you showed that you'd stented, but you had incomplete expansion with your MLA around 4.5 because of a nodule. In those sorts of cases, laser is really useful. So, you know, before, when you're doing your laser, you've not got your imaging there. You learn about it after you finish your laser, you've got your imaging tool after that, you already completed your laser. Now with that, you're not going, uh, so the question is, would you go back and do a laser with contrast then? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, awesome. I've done a of times. The IVL okay. is the king of the corners. The laser and rotor, they're not the king of the corners. So still have a role for IVL, for medial and the corners. So we'll continue these discussions with some cases now. So thank you, Kirti. Uh, excellent discussion, eye-opening, and now,